This video was sponsored by Hitpoint Press and Humblewood Tales, now on Kickstarter. Who let the dogs out? Who let the dogs out? It was me. I let the dogs out. Or rather, I'm about to. Welcome to Monster of the Week, the only show on the internet that seems to give a shit there isn't a dog race in D&D 5th edition. I mean, we have rabbits, birds, lizards, hyenas, half a horse, half a cow, frogs, tortoises, and elephants. For Pilor's sake, there are two cat races, so how have we never received a D&D race option for man's best friend? And before you even type the comment, no. Gnolls are not dogs, they are hyenas, which are a type of creature so weird they have their own special classification in zoology. Biologically speaking, they're most related to mongooses, but I digress. In contemplating the sheer lack of puppy paladins in D&D, I had a thought. There's just no way there has never been a dog race in the entire history of D&D, I said. So a googling I did go, and sure enough, there were two dog races in D&D's past. The first was called the Laika, and they were created as a bare bones race option published as part of a web supplement put out for the third edition D&D book called Savage Species. But the Laika aren't a fully fleshed out race with their own culture and history and all the other things that make a race option compelling. They were merely an exercise meant to show dungeon masters how they might go about homebrewing their own races and the author simply used a dog person as an example. While valuable in its own way, I wanted something more than just a spreadsheet named after a Russian cosmonaut. I wanted the juice, I wanted lore, I wanted compelling narrative, I wanted... A little je ne sais quoi. So my search continued, and eventually, I found exactly what I was looking for. Lupins are humanoid creatures with canine heads, and for all intents and purposes, are essentially anthropomorphic dogs. Their history in the game as a recurring cast of creatures is definitely a storied one. There's a lot to go over here, but stick with me on this one because, well, you'll see what I mean. To get things started, we're gonna roll the clock back to 1981. Donkey Kong was the new hotness in the arcade, NASA sent some people into space, and Castle Amber, an adventure for characters level three to six, is hot off the press. This adventure marked the second entry in the X series of adventures for the Dungeons and Dragons Expert Rules set. And it is here, starting on page 25, that the Lupin race is born. The text simply describes them as dog-like humanoids covered from head to toe in fur with canine heads. The second line of text in the Lupin's monster entry then goes on to say they hate werewolves and will attack them on sight. The entry also mentions they have a tribal society and they ride on trained direwolves. That's about it. They do show up as enemies a couple times within the adventure, but overall we're basically just looking at canine-headed furries that ride on big dogs sometimes. Had this been the end of it, I probably wouldn't be making this video right now. But what follows is one of the strangest and most disjointed example of a creature's publication history that I have ever come across. The Lupin would show up again in 1985 as part of another expert set module, the Savage Coast. Their monster entry here is identical to the one from Castle Amber, but the way they are used in the module gives us a bit more insight into their personality. At some point during the adventure, the players can cross paths with the Lupin at the Lawful Alliance Camp a small settlement populated entirely by lupins. The lupins in this adventure are friendly and will offer the players food and drink as long as they approach directly and make themselves known. However, if they try to sneak up on the camp, even if they're not up to anything necessarily mischievous, they will be treated as hostiles by the lupins. And just like that, with that one singular detail, a personality begins to form but we still have a ways to go. Let's jump ahead to 1992. Dragon Magazine issue 179 comes out in March, and in maybe the weirdest way imaginable, the Lupins return to the spotlight. For a bit of context, in Dragon Magazines published between January of 1990 and December of 1992, there was an ongoing series of short stories collectively called The Voyage of the Princess Ark. In each edition of the magazine, we would get a new chapter to the story, which was told as the personal log belonging to the captain and other crew members of a skyship which traveled all across the world of 
of Mistara. Each entry of the captain's log would tell of a new location and expand on the lore of the world. And usually, on the pages following that month's chapter, there would be maps and rules to support whatever the story had been about. So, in the Voyage of the Princess Arc Part 26, titled A Glass of Wine and a Shaggy Dog Story, the captain and crew encounter the Lupins of Renardi, or Renardi if you're one of them anglicized folks. It would seem, in this telling of the Lupin tale, they have moved on from their tribal past and become French nobles. This is not a joke. In the story, they speak with phonetically spelled out French accents and everything. Ah, cher prince, cried the monarch, arms wide and a broad smile on his Lupin muzzle. Bienvenue to Louvine! Sacre bleu, you look so tired! Ah, but of course, it must be the navy food! Please honor my table! Our chef has prepared the best banquet for you! C'est magnifique! <laughs> <laughs> the dog people are French now! Holy sh! But it isn't just a random change, either. There are then several pages of Lupin lore which go over their rise from a disjointed group of various clans to a proper kingdom united under one French-speaking banner. It's not like we really had a lot to go on before this, but I do love that they took the time to not invalidate the three sentences of personality the Lupins already had. Look guys, I've read so many issues of Dragon Magazine and doing research for this channel, and this might be the best one. <laughs> also, look at this artwork. It's... it's all just so wonderful. But wait! There's more! Because in 1996, the Lupins would appear yet again in the Savage Coast Campaign Book, which was an individual supplement put out based on the Princess Arc series and other bits of the Mistara campaign setting. Most of the stuff here is just reiterated from Dragon 179, but it's cool that they kept the very endangered Lupin race alive and well. Now, if you can believe this, things with the Lupin lore are about to go even further off the deep end. I, I was not prepared for what I was about to discover. In July of 1997, yet another issue of Dragon Magazine containing the Lupins would be published. In the table of contents, splash art of a menacing dog sits beside an article teaser, which reads, Campaign Classics, Lupins of the Mistara setting. The many breeds of Lupins make fine canine PCs. Okay, brace yourself, because it's exactly what you think. You were thinking it would be 11 separate pages of Lupin subraces, right? Because that's what it is! Just page after page of various Lupin subraces, all based on different real-world dog breeds. Some of the artwork is kind of hard to make out, but that is absolutely a golden retriever with a long sword. And what's this? He appears to be across the page from a Doberman? Get it? because he's a man. Bruce Hurd, the absolute madman, published an 11-page article detailing 37 different varieties of Lupin, complete with rules for stats, size, bite damage, senses, class preferences, and movement. <laughs> Bruce literally sat down and said, oh, you want to be a dog person in D&D? Don't worry, I f***ing got you. This video is already going to be kind of long, and I don't have the time or, quite frankly, the sanity to go over every single one of these dog breed entries with you, but here are a few of my favorites. Dashend Lupins are notorious spies and thieves. Commodore Lupins are mad sages that wander the lands in search of eternal truths. Chow Chow Lupins were fucking slave hunters forced to work for Onis, but then they rebelled and gained their freedom. And for one last entry, we've got Bulldog Lupins, who are known to basically be construction workers and tavern keepers that 100% speak with a Brooklyn accent. Oh man. Now, taking one final jump in time to the year 2004, in issue 325 of Dragon Magazine, we find this amazing screenshot of what I'm sure at the time was a cutting-edge Warhammer game for PC. But on the page before that, page 5, the table of contents, the end of our journey is within view. Page 84, Winning Races, Lupins, the classic race, returns to D&D, and return they did. In this issue of Dragon Magazine, 
Mike McArthur lovingly and diligently went through the same journey that we just did. He read every scrap of lore and pieced it all together in one final coherent entry in the Lupin saga of publications. The actual article is only four pages long, including this awesome cover art. But in those four pages, we get basically every relevant bit of information about the Lupin, along with some new stuff that gels perfectly with the Lupin ecology. With the Lupin race transferred into D&D 3rd Edition, we finally had a concise entry for one of D&D's coolest player race options. So, what does the most current Lupin entry actually say? Let's check it out together. Lupins have a pretty similar lifespan to humans, with the exception being that they reach adulthood around 14 years of age. Once they do reach maturity, they undergo a ritual where they spend a single night in the grasslands alone, with only their mount as a companion. But once this rite of passage has been fulfilled, the young Lupin immediately begins training to hunt and kill the ancestral enemy of their people, Lycanthropes or more specifically, werewolves. The Lupin Vendetta against werewolves has almost a spiritual significance. Hunting a werewolf is considered a great honor and rite of passage to the Lupin people, which might seem kind of weird because of the whole dog thing. But the origin of this practice is actually kind of interesting. It's thought that the Lupin people actually stem from a werewolf bloodline. But rather than allowing themselves to be overcome with bloodlust at the full moon, they managed to control themselves and eventually excise the savagery that the curse of lycanthropy brings. The fact that they so closely resemble a werewolf in hybrid form is a huge factor in why they hate the werewolf so much as well. After all, when people not familiar with the lupins see them for the first time, they often mistake them for werewolves. It's almost like they're overcompensating with their hatred towards werewolves, as if they're saying to the world, Hey everybody, we're cool, we're nice guys, we're not werewolves, we don't like them either. And this of course eventually became a major part of their culture to the point where the three days of the full moon have become a religious time for lupins. During this time, they gather all their best werewolf hunters, called Hruffs, into a temporary hunting pack and then proceed to seek and destroy any lycanthropes they can get their paws on. It's also really interesting how these packs are structured. See, every Lupin community is made up of 3 to 12 packs, and every pack of Lupins is made up of 5 to 10 separate individuals, not including pups. So the Lupins have a sort of immediate family amongst their pack, and then a much larger family with their whole community. Weirdly, this is pretty similar to how Hobgoblin society is structured, but that's a topic for a different day. These larger communities also operate under a strict egalitarian democracy, with a new individual from a different pack being chosen as the spokesperson for the community every year. These elected leaders then head out on a journey once per year with a retinue of younger Lupins at their side to meet with the leaders of all the other Lupin communities in the region at an event which they refer to as a White Howl. These White Howls are a way for the elder Lupins from all all the different communities across the land to gather and discuss their plans for the following year. They're also a way for the next generation of up-and-coming Lupins to connect with one another and move between communities if they so choose. And while the White Howl often begins with lots of pomp and circumstance, once business is attended to, they frequently devolve into crazy dog person parties. Overall, the Lupin are a friendly and kind race, so long as you're not a lycanthrope, and they value trust and integrity, along with loyalty, among almost all other things. In fact, they are friendly nearly to a fault. They trust others quite easily and find themselves making fast friends everywhere they go. When this trust is well placed, that can be a huge asset to them. But if that trust is ever broken, there will be hell to pay. Speaking of which, I have converted the Lupin into 5th edition D&D both as a player race and as a couple monster stat blocks for the DMs out there. So let's get a little bit crunchy and look at some mechanics. Yeah. 
Lupins as a playable race are exactly what you would expect from a dog person. However, a lot has changed in the world of player race design since the days of 3.5. So what I've got for you is the Lupin race as I kind of envision them with a lot of their classic traits directly converted into 5th edition. So let's go over it. For starters, they have dark vision. Pretty straightforward. But then of course we need an ability to reflect their incredible sense of smell and hearing, and that's where Lupine Senses comes in. This trait gives the Lupin proficiency on any ability check that relies on hearing or smell, even if the individual creature isn't actually proficient in that ability. It also grants advantage on any check made to track a creature or an object because dogs. We of course also had to give the Lupin a bite attack and I also wanted to find a way to reflect that die-hard Lupin loyalty. The trait I came up with is something that I have named Fierce Loyalty. This trait allows the Lupin to use their reaction as a way of forcing an attack to target them instead of one of their friends. Because nothing really says loyalty like jumping in front of a swinging blade to absorb a sword strike that was intended for your bud. Outside of that you'll find all the other language and generic rules for a player race in 5th edition, and I'm pretty happy with the results here overall. In terms of character ideas, I feel like rangers and druids are an obvious choice, especially with the expert tracking the lupine race affords. But I also can't shake the idea of a lupin necromancer. There's just something so funny to me about a dog guy digging up bones and chewing on one of them for a bit before turning it into a fucking ghoul. So if you do want to use them as a player race option, there's a link in the description below that has everything you need. But within that link, you will also find two lupin stat blocks. The first one is for the lupin Hruff, which is the werewolf hunter class of creatures. And the other is for the lupin Silvar, which is the typical druidic spiritual leader of the lupin people. Both stat blocks are fairly simple, but I think they capture the vibe of this creature in a really fun way. Also, something to keep in mind is that as a humanoid race, you can literally use any of the generic NPC stat blocks such as the Bandit or Champion. All you have to do is include the keen hearing and smell trait and you're ready to rock and roll some dice. Now we've covered a lot so far, but there's still one lingering question. How the heck do we use the Lupins at the game table? I feel like this goes without saying, but as an intelligent humanoid, the Lupin can do anything any of the other races can do within a story. But with that said, I feel like one really dramatic story you could tell would be that of a Lupin who has been wounded on a werewolf hunt gone bad. Perhaps the party comes across this bloody and beaten Lupin Hraff that they have an opportunity to help. See, this Lupin was part of a werewolf hunt, but when they made it to their target, it turned out not to be a regular werewolf at all but a loop guru from Van Richten's guide. This ended up being much more than they bargained for, and the alpha werewolf tore many of them to shreds. And now, it's up to the party to help. Or maybe the local werewolf population has just had enough of the Lupins hunting them down, and they decide to strike back. Our heroes might have to find a way to help the Lupin people by aiding in the fight against lycanthropes, or perhaps driving them away to some other place. If you want to get a bit political here, maybe instead of werewolves, you use a lycanthrope that isn't so bloodthirsty, such as were bears. Then, instead of just a simple kill or be killed situation, there's some room for diplomacy. I also imagine that if a pack of Lupin were to ever fall on hard times, they would make excellent mercenaries. Their uncanny tracking ability would certainly come in handy for anybody looking to hunt someone down. Maybe the party finds themselves pursued by Lupin hunters on the payroll of some individual they crossed in the past. That could be pretty dramatic. And speaking of drama, there is one particular setting that I think the Lupin would fit in with exquisitely, and that setting is Ravenloft. If you happen to be running Curse of Strahd or any adventure in Ravenloft, what would be more fitting than a bunch of rebellious werewolves who Strahd can no longer control? Maybe a pack of Lupin roams the countryside and has made it their mission to protect travelers on the road from the werewolves that stalk the forest. You could have an entire faction of them set up, hiding in secret, or maybe willing to work with the party if their goals align. But all in all, I think the Lupin race is so fascinating and so interesting, and I love the crazy amount of detail in their backstory. And honestly, I'm just happy to have found a singular canine race within Dungeons and Dragons that's more than just 
a dog guy. Hopefully someday they will get reprinted in 5th edition and given the whole royal treatment with brand new art and stat blocks and adventures and NPCs and all that stuff. But for now, all I hope is that I can hang on to the Lupin Torch which has been passed down through decades and multiple editions of the game until someone at Wizards of the Coast is ready to pick it up. As I mentioned, if you want to use this creature or the player race, it's all linked down below. And if you are one of my awesome patrons, you can find the fancy schmancy PDF with all the stats and whatnot over on the Dungeon Dad Patreon page is my way of saying thanks for the extra support. I also want to give a special shout out to this week's sponsor, the Humblewood Tales Kickstarter. Humblewood Tales is a companion book to the Humblewood campaign setting for 5th edition, featuring expanded lore around the mystical tree city of Alderheart. Gather your party and embark on five new Humblewood adventures for levels 3 through 8 where you'll encounter pirate mercenaries, face off against a slime king, take on the amaranthine kren in a nightmarish dreamscape, and much more. With over 200 pages of new content that's fully compatible with all your 5e games, including pre-made characters, a full bestiary, myriads of new magic items, and more, there's plenty of thrills to be had for both new and seasoned Humblewood adventurers. Humblewood Tales is available as a book, box set, and Kickstarter exclusive collector's edition. What tales will you tell? So be sure to check out Humblewood Tales today by visiting dd.humblewoodtales.com or simply by clicking that link in the description down below. Thank you so much to Hitpoint Press for bringing us here this week to talk about Lupins, a very fitting sponsor for an episode about dog people, I think. And thank you for watching. Wait just a second. You didn't think I forgot, did you? It's time for Patron of the Week! This week's randomly selected patron is Jeffrey Walker. Thank you so much for walking on over to the Patreon page. I appreciate the extra support immensely. I also want to give a shout out to Indestructiboy for the awesome formatting on the Patreon specific stat block and for helping me workshop some of the language around the actual race options. It all came together in a really cool way and I have Taryn to thank for that. So thank you Taryn and you guys should all go check out his stuff, especially if you enjoy RPG game design. This was such a fun monster to research and I just love the fact that after doing this for like five years and the many years of playing RPGs before that, I can still find these weird rabbit holes of creatures that go from source to source to source to source and like it's all crazy and spread out all over the place. I loved it. I had so much fun researching for this thing. Plus, now you can be a good boy. Make a Golden Retriever Paladin. Make a Labrador Warlock. Make a Yorkie Assassin or a Chow Chow who broke free from its Oni Masters. I don't know. Because while I mean the Lupin are specifically supposed to be a wolf race, like they're flavored after wolves, you could easily just be like, oh yeah, this one is a chocolate lab. I don't know. <laughs> There's all kinds of fun stuff you can do. And I want to hear about your plot hooks and story ideas for the Lupin race, so... Leave a comment with all that stuff, let me know. And as always, if there is a monster you want to see show up on the channel from a previous edition of D&D or another tabletop game, either let me know in the comments or let me know on the Monster Suggestions channel in the Discord. Anyways, that's pretty much all I've got for this week. Thank you guys very much. I'll see you in the next one. Till then.